All right, you lot, don't forget to give us a follow on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And while you're at it, give us a five-star rating. Trust me, it really does help us out. The only thing I do miss is winter testing when you first get the cars really? out on track. Okay. Because there's something very cool and special about getting that car out of the garage for the first time. And would that be the first time, because I'm just thinking with your job role, would you... Would that be the first time you've seen the car? No. So obviously I see it in the factory. Um, and then Red Bull started doing this thing where they do a filming day at Silverstone, mm -hmm. normally like a week or two before Barcelona. And I'm there for the filming day. So I, the first time I see it is when it's fired up mm. in the uh, race bays in Milton Keynes before it goes to Silverstone mm -hmm. for its filming day. And then it, travels to Barcelona and then I meet it out there for winter testing okay so yeah but there is something very cool about seeing that car on track for the yeah. first time so did you um obviously you left at the end of 2021 so did yep. you have had you seen in any capacity this 2022 car I saw a wind tunnel model mm -hmm. and it looked absolutely nothing like it does now really yeah so that's how quick it moves and when would that have been like when I month? saw it yeah in November Okay, so like just before you left? Yeah. Oh, wow. No, I saw it. must have been the start of November, and it looked nothing like what it looks now. Mm. So do you reckon the team had a few different... Oh, I mean, obviously, they did have... But yeah. how many different... Do you know how many different philosophies they had on the table before they decided on the one they've got? Uh, a specific number? No. But obviously, it would definitely be more than one. Yeah. Um, and then the one that they use now is not one I saw. So it was either tucked away somewhere mm. or Adrian's... Had his red ball and gone on a mad one. <laughs> Pulled an all-nighter. Yeah. Just change it all. Yeah. I mean, like, look, he's only human. Yeah. Adrian, it's Christmas dinner. You've got to cut the turkey. <laughs> Not now. <laughs> I've got some winglets to design. I mean, I wouldn't put it past him, honestly. That's, that's what greatness is. You know what I mean? But yeah. Adrian has got... Here we go. Here's a little tidbit go for you. Adrian oh, has go. got a connection at his house directly to the factory. Really? Yeah. So he can hard work. Hardwired in. Yeah, so he can work on all the CFD and things like that while he's at home. I reckon he just like plugs him, his whole body in. Pretty you, much. You know, like those um, cryogenic chamber. I reckon mm. he just gets in one of them and then it just pa he just powers the Yeah, factory. well, you would like to think that, yeah. but I have seen Adrian's home office and his office at Milton Keynes and it is a complete bomb site. Really? How that man does what he does. His filing system is just basically sheets of paper everywhere and drawings. And That's it's... Fair play to him. That's it clearly what, works. That's what genius but, looks like sometimes. Yeah, it is chaotic. That is, that's what I mean. It's, it's stuff like that that I just think, you know, we put these teams on a pedestal and you just have this impression as a fan looking in that everything's like, but actually it's just, it's just people yeah. working. Because obviously you're, you know, did it, did Red Bull feel like, because obviously that's the only F1 team you work for, but mm -hmm. did it feel like a sports team or did it feel, because it is technically a sports team, but it kind of isn't, you know what I mean? Like, what, did it feel like a sports team at all? Was it only on race weekends that you would get that competitive feel? Yeah, so, yeah, like race weekends, you do sort of get that more of a sporting feel. But other times, it's very hard not to feel like this is only a marketing exercise, which it is. Mm -hmm. You know, I think Red Bull are very open about that. Yeah. They've said, we're just in F1 to get eyes on the brand. And it's, you know, working doing a good job um, and, and because that's the way they treat it I don't think there's as many um, external eyes on so let's say Ferrari okay. you must, yeah, yeah. You could, I, I don't want to know how many eyes within the Ferrari motor company high up are looking at the racing team plus right the Tafosi, plus yeah. Italian media yeah. yeah whereas Red Bull the actual Red Bull company itself were actually really hands off with Red Bull racing Okay. There was very little interaction with them. It was a case of Helmut Marco and Christian would present uh, like a budgetary figure to Dietrich Mateschitz, the owner of Red Bull, say, we need this amount of money. Mm -hmm. And Dietrich, nine times out of ten, went, sure, have it. There you go. And that was it. There was... Interesting. Well, because talking of Helmut, <clears throat> and I know it, obviously Helmut, that people were talking about him to do with the junior program, but like... From your, what, what does Helmet actually do at Red Bull? Helmet is basically the uh, eyes and ears of Dietrich Mateschitz in F1. So he reports directly to okay. Dietrich and um, he oversees 
Red Bull Racing and Alpha Tauri, as well as the junior program. So when you say overseas, like... Christian answers to him. Christian answers to Helmut. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So, so, so Helmut, yeah. Helmut's not... He's, I think he's classed as an advisor. Yeah, so, so does Christian... Does Christian answer to Helmut or does Christian answer to Dietrich via Helmut? You know what I mean? Yeah, it's probably more like that. Okay. Um, but yeah, don't get... Just, just don't get on the bad side of Helmut, mate. And the bloke is terrifying. D uh, does he warrant the reputation he has from your, from your experience or I guess people you've spoken to? Because he, he's got that... He's got that reputation. Yeah, he's got the bond. Oh, ice cold. The bond villain 100%. all nailed he, down. He needs to be at the... Red Bull need the MTC because that is a bond mm, villain yeah. lair. But... <laughs> uh, my limited interactions with Helmut left me questioning my existence. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, he's obviously good at what he does um, with the junior program. Mm -hmm. I think you look at the grid now, how many drivers are on the grid that came through the Red Bull junior program. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's proof enough that he must know what he's talking about. Mm. Uh, so yeah, it's just mildly terrifying. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. He's got that. But I mean, you forget he used to be a racing driver. Yeah. He did what, set, I didn't think he did a full season, but he did plenty of, well, I think he did like seven, eight Grand Prix back in the day. Which is seven or eight more than what I've done. Exactly. So the he man obviously knows. Clearly can drive. Um, and then obviously we can't talk about Red Bull, not talk about Max Verstappen. Mm. Did you have many comings together with Max? Did you have much experience with him on a yeah. personal level? Yeah. Again, another real nice guy. Um, not, not, didn't have too many interactions with him. Obviously, he lives in Monaco, so nice. we didn't really see him that often in the factory unless he was on a simulator day or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, but yeah, no, one, one of the things I like to say uh, or tell is that when I was trackside, IT, we don't have a very glamorous area, right? No. It's IT. No one cares about us. We're not allowed to be seen. No windows Try or anything. Try turning like it off that. and on again. Yeah. So <laughs> our area, trackside, is quite hidden away. Yep. No one really bothers you in there. But what I liked about Max was that if he was ever feeling stressed out by the media or, or whatever, mm -hmm. he'd would, he would find his way to IT and just sort of sit with us and just hide, basically. <laughs> and he would just sort of, you know, tell us about what he was doing for Christmas, yeah, ask yeah. how our families were, things like that, you know. And then you'd get a radio call. Has anyone seen Max? And he'd go out <laughs> there after you. <laughs> <and stuff. laughs> See you later, guys. And so off he wandered. So, yeah. That's the thing, because, you know, love him or, or loathe him for how he races, I think there is clearly a very down-to-earth mm. kid there. Yeah. And I think, again, I suppose in the same way that you were saying about, I, I think when drivers make the time for, because I'm sure there's plenty of drivers throughout Formula One who have very much felt like they're the, they're the superior in that kind of relationship. Mm. But I guess, like, I guess that's part of why... You know, because Max said after Abu Dhabi, he was like, I want to be with this team forever. Like, do you think that's going to be the case? Because it seems like there's an unreal relationship between Red Bull, the yeah. Red Bull team, not forget the brand, but the team, the people yeah. and Max. Yeah, I, I think there's a very real possibility that Max never leaves Red Bull racing. If they can keep running at the front mm. for... You know, and Max has got a long time in his career left. Mm. I know he's been in F1 for a while, but he's so he started so young. Yeah. I mean, he's still, what was he now? 20, 24? 24, 25? I mean, he's got another 10 years maybe easily. 25, yeah. yeah. This is his eighth season, I yeah, think. Yeah, that's mental to think. He yeah. could end up doing, let's say, 18 seasons for one team. Well, this weekend was his fourth or fifth win in a row. Um, so he's hunting down Sebastian Vettel's nine oh, in a row yeah. record as well. Yeah. Which is, is pretty ominous. But like what do you what do you think makes Max special? I know obviously you're you're not like a trackside engineer, but yeah. like from what you know, what do you think it is that makes him seemingly this kind of golden prospect? Max will drive a car hunt like ten tenths even in a practice session. He, like, he doesn't matter if you can, like, Max be careful with the car. He's like, no, I need to see where the limits are. So lap one, he's out mm. there and he's bouncing it off of curbs and apexes. And he's like, I need to see what the grip level's like. Whereas other drivers are a bit more sort of, they build into the week. Yeah, yeah. Whereas Max is like, I've done it on iRacing at home. What does it matter? <laughs> Let's just go for it sort of thing, you know? <laughs> Same thing, right? And uh, he's just very, he gives it all straight away. And I think that's what makes it, him so quick compared to everyone else but also I think an often overlooked part of Max's success and Rebels is GP 
Because I, yeah. I mean, uh, from what I know in the outside looking in, I think GP, like he manages Max so well. He's so level-headed. He's been in the sport for a long time. But again, do, did you have much interaction with GP at all? Like, Actually, no, to be honest. I didn't actually have a huge amount of interaction with GP. Um, I'm trying to think if I ever really did. Mm. I can't think Cause of any Because it's such a big head. organization. It's like over a thousand people. Yeah. So it's quite normal. But yeah, yeah. I suppose it's like, oh, you're Red Bull, so you must know Helmet. It's like, no, it doesn't Yeah, like everyone that. thinks I'm going around Christians for like a barbecue <laughs> or whatever sort of thing, you know? Or everyone thinks I've got a signed copy of Jerry Horner's single at home or something like that. Um, but no, like you say, there's a thousand people. Yeah, yeah. And I was there six years and there were certain people that I'd see every day and mm -hmm. I still don't know what their names were. Yeah. I don't know what they did. 